Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chats with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Kia ora everybody, welcome to another episode of Baskets of Knowledge. Hopefully you've had a fantastic week doing all the fun things. Um, and if you're in New Zealand, hopefully you've been keeping warm because the temperatures have plummeted quite drastically over the last week. Um, Tani, how have you been over the last week and what have you learned in the last week? Yeah, good. It's been a busy, oh, yeah, busy week, just trying to finish everything off and start packing ready for my trip to Aussie next week. So that's very exciting. But um, I guess something I've learned um, with my birthday being a couple of weeks ago now, um, just reflecting on, I guess, you know, where we, our, our own identities and just having a real sense of what that looks like. I think, you know, obviously last year I came out of study and then I've been in this weird transition period. And I think, you know, reflecting on my birthday, I just realized, you know, like what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve? And I think it's good to, you know, sometimes ask that question because otherwise you just go through the motions just simply because you're going through the motions, but also, you know, something for me, as we've talked about previously, you know, my huge passion for girls in the female coaching space. And that's almost become my identity while I've been in this transition period. And that's not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's just trying to learn to associate other things to my identity in terms of what I'm trying to do and the person I am. So I guess really just reflecting on, yeah, not necessarily always just pinpointing yourself and your identity to the passions or the hobbies or whatever you might be doing in that point of time, but really just trying to, yeah, lot, not lose sense of myself and the things that I'm doing just because I'm in that space majority of the time. Yeah, and you know, that's 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 really beautiful because it, it segues really well into my learning from this week here. And um, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine over the weekend. He was struggling with, with the same thing that you're talking about, Tane, that... Um, he, he's he's been in the industry for a very long time and his identity is defined by that position in his industry and he's trying to find a new job but he's afraid that if he does that he's going to lose his identity and it got me reflecting about me and I think you talk about this many many times you know I work at the University of Otago and a lot of people see that as my only identity which is pretty crazy when there's a lot more to me um, and sometimes you go if I move on to another place another role um, what does that make me? Question mark, question mark. And so it, it reminds me again to a quote that I keep on, you know, I always like to reference what I hear from Joe Rogan because why not? He's, mm-hmm. he's controversially awesome. But um, he always, he says the thing which I really like. He always says people get married, married to the identity or the ideas. And then when they move on, they, well, they don't move on because of their marriage. Um, so I think, as you said before, that's just one part of who you are. And that's one part of who I am. But it's hard to do that. You know, it's good to reflect. But then the next step is the, the hard the reflection is mm-hmm. awesome what happens next so um yeah i think it's, it's a, probably at the right time for the two of us to have this mm. to, you know to yeah. to think about this year especially as you go off to your amazing trip over the next few days which will be pretty cool mm. um but as always to our regular listeners and our new listeners um we're not going to talk here we have um invited a fantastic guest as you know we try and scour the country and the world for some people we think we're amazing and as always we think everyone is amazing we'd love to have as many people here as possible but you know, we don't have the resources, but hey, that's all cool. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. And today I'm really proud, really privileged and really um, honored to have a person that I have had the privilege of watching grow as a young person into a young adult and doing some pretty cool things as, as they've conquered the world in a very specific way. Um, thank you for coming to our podcast and welcome to our podcast, Alida. Yeah, kia ora. thanks for having me. Um... Yeah, it's, it's really cool to be here, and then I love the love the podcast and love love what you guys do. So, yeah, awesome, Alida. Um, before I even talk about what you do, I just what a crazy time to have you on because you work in the whole energy space, and right now, um, in New Zealand is we have this whole energy crisis. We've got to turn off our power and stuff, but also we've got this crazy electric storm happening with crazy auroras around the place. So that's pretty exciting at this point yeah, in time. Yeah. In this conversation. Yeah, definitely. Like the the energy sector is so cool that it's got so many different layers and aspects to it, but it's also so topical. Like it's something you interact with every day, a lot of the time just without even thinking about it. Um, but yeah, it, definitely a, a lot of news stories this week. And it's cool to see like, yeah, the the kind of risk of power shortages this week were real, um, but it's really cool to see how the industry managed it. And they pulled a lot of levers to keep the lights on. And it's cool when 
that all comes together because there's not a lot of opportunity to practice that unless it is the real situation. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what a, what a timely time to have this conversation here where this is happening, like it's very topical for those that live in New Zealand. Um, I know the other day when I was in with a colleague, he kept getting these texts going, oh, you better reduce the power, you better turn off your power. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? And then as you said, in today's ODT, the headline is about the Aurora, Aurora that are going nuts at the moment. So um, pretty crazy. But before we come to all that there, um, Alida, two people who know nothing about who you are as a person, do you want to tell our guests about, our listeners, sorry, who you are and what you do at this moment in time? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm I'm from Wellington. That's where I come from. Um, I grew up here, just moved back here. Um, I went to University of Otago, um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But yes, in high school, I knew like I really, really loved science. Um, I took all the science subjects, couldn't get enough of it. I guess I just liked the learning more part and like trying to understand different things. Um, I really thought about doing engineering, um, I guess, because that seemed to be what everyone expected that I was going to do. Like I did physics, I did chemistry, I did maths. Of course, I would go study engineering and it was kind of that expectation. And I watched a lot of people I know, um, like my cousins, family members, they all did that as well. And I just didn't think that engineering was what I wanted. I looked into it a bit, went to some engineering experience days and it just didn't, I didn't want to build bridges or design roads and that kind of thing just wasn't for me. Um, in hindsight, like I now work as an engineer, so I got that wrong. But I think part of the problem was trying to explain that engineering is just about problem solving and it's something that I really like doing. And it's cool when there are a lot of problems in the world that need solving and you need a lot of different lenses looking into that. So being able to kind of cover some aspect of that um and do some problem solving and try and try and fix those problems is quite quite a fun thing to do but um yeah I, I ended up at the University of Otago studying science um physics at the start and kind of stumbled upon the physics department at Otago has a hidden secret um and that is this energy management program that not many people do even like no one knows about it um but it's a super interesting topic. So it's kind of taking the science of physics and to an extent chemistry, but applying it just to energy systems. So it's you're learning science, but applying it to something quite specific and something that you see every day. So whether it's like actually how you might get um, energy to your house, like the electricity industry or even like taking a step back and like looking at kind of generation, how electricity is generated, um, all of that kind of thing. So like taking the science of that and learning that. And I really enjoyed that. There was, I fully thought that I was going to go and be a chemistry researcher for the rest of my life until I got into like the, the last years of my undergrad of this degree and just realized like the energy industry is so cool and um, decided that's yeah, kind of what I wanted to to get into. So now yeah, that's what I do. I work in the energy industry. I get to solve a lot of problems about the energy industry. Specifically, I work in the decarbonization space, which is so cool because it's all about trying to help um, Aotearoa reduce energy emissions um, or kind of carbon emissions in general. So trying to reduce our impact on the climate kind of through an energy lens. Oh, yeah. what a what what a great um great summary I guess of of what you do and what you've been doing, and I guess my my first question for you or conversation starter is, as a young as a young female in this space here, yeah, you know um, you know STEM already has a has a stigma for being males, and then physics specifically and chemistry you know a lot of males in there. What is it like for you, especially as you got into those further years when you realize actually hey I love this stuff here, yeah, I'm going to. Um, break this narrative and be a female in the space. So what is it like for you? I'm um, exploring that, I guess. Or did you not even think about it? Yeah, that's it's that's, that's a really good question because I, I honestly never did. Like at university, there was always like pretty good balance um, in the classes. It didn't matter. Like the people I work, like studied with and things, they were, they didn't treat you any differently because you're a female or male or anything. Like it was fine. And I did like kind of my first industry kind of internship um and on my first day I sat down and the guy next to me just pointed out he's like 
oh, you should apply for our grad program. This is before I'd even started the internship. It's like, you should apply for our grad program because you're a woman, like you'll get it. I was like, well, thanks. But like, I actually, I want to get her kind of on, on my own merits. This is so strange. It was like just this first, it was my first introduction to the internship, but also just like the fact that you do really stand out. Um, and the en energy industry isn't great for in that a lot of the time you can just be the only woman in the room. And especially like at this, where I started was at um, an electricity company working in one of the engineering teams. I think of all the engineers that they had on staff, there was one full-time woman. Like there are other women in the business, but just there's, there's just not many of them. Um, and then, yeah, it was from then that I started to realize that actually this was something. And when I joined DITA, the company I work for now, um, the company has a woman in engineering group set up. And I didn't at first kind of understand like why, why do we have a group just for us women engineers? There's about eight of us now um, of a company of about 50 or 60. And I was like, why do we have this group? Like, why do we need it? It's just kind of like, yeah, now that I've been in the role just over a year, I started to see like, it is like really valuable having kind of a space for like just being able to talk about things that happen with we work a lot with clients or interacting with a lot of different people within the energy industry a lot of them kind of fit the pale stale male brief um it makes it it's you do stand out you do often just kind of it can be very condescending um so kind of navigating that just feeling like you have to prove yourself a lot of the time when maybe like your other colleagues don't have to um, so it's really cool that we've got a space for that. And I got, I'm really privileged this year to be able to actually be leading it and cool. like leading kind of like the support network, trying to find ways in which we can support each other. So it's like an internal element, but also kind of support other women to kind of join industry. Cause that's, I guess like the end goal is that this Lovely. isn't, this isn't something happening anymore. Um, so that's really cool. I really enjoy that. So getting out into schools um talking to people through like mentoring or networking events yeah we do a lot a lot of that the school stuff especially that's that's been really great yeah yeah and i, I thought of the question there because I, I love what you said at the start that, you know when you're in when you're at school you don't think about it when you're at university you don't think about it because everything is like you said nobody actually really cares what gender you are at university everyone just everyone just does their thing and then it's crazy when you get into, into the real world in inverted commas um things change quite dramatically and i know tana you've been facing that because you know at the start you mentioned that you know um, women in sport is something that's really your passion at the moment, but you faced the whole the whole gender thing has come to you as well. Tane. Yeah, and I think that's yeah that's something I'm trying to navigate at the moment. And I think yeah, it is tough because uh, you know there's already discussions and there have been for the last couple of years around getting females into coaching roles. You know, like they're always typically managers or you know they've never been put into the coaching scenarios and so trying to change that narrative but I think also yeah trying to find that balance you know that I can stay in the sport because you know there's I think for, for me anyway my perspective is you know there are there's definitely coaches that you can see in that space that have been put there because they were seen to be the best person for the job and that, you know, they've just been kind of the temporary fill. But then there are people like me who are definitely, you know, strongly passionate about that space. And so I don't want to be taken away from that space, you know, and that's, that's not me trying to be selfish or, you know, anything like that, but it's just to say there are people in those spaces that just because I'm not female doesn't mean I'm not adding value to the space. And I think, you know, it's, yeah, as I say, it's a tricky situation and it's going to be, an interesting to, one to navigate as we go forward, but it's definitely trying to find that balance so that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all doing it for the success of female sports, not, you know, just putting people into certain positions for the for the status quo or to change, you know, the narrative. Yeah, I guess as I said, that, that, as you said, Adida, you know, you were like, I, I don't want to just be the grad program because I'm a female. I want to be there because of my merit. I know what I'm doing. It's not just because I'm X, Y, Z, I'm taking a box, you know, and that's, you know, that's a, it's a tricky space for anyone to navigate, but um, it's pretty awesome, Adida, to see what you're doing. And the fact that you're going to schools is really quite cool because, um, you know, I do that there and I love what I do because, um, you know, when you go into a school, you have no idea what you say that is going to spark an interest for somebody in, in, that, in the classroom. There, so it's pretty cool that you're doing mm -hmm. that there. And talking about sparking interest in the classroom, Alita, think about yourself as a year 13. If when you're in year 13 at St. Kath's all those years ago, and if someone said to you, hey, Alita, in 
X amount of years you were going to be working in the energy space, what would you have said at that point in time, even though you had this thought that engineering was the thing that people do? If I said to you, hey, Alida, I see you in, in 2024, you're going to be in the energy space, what would you have said? I think we would have been pretty surprised. Like, I didn't think liking chemistry and physics would have got me to this point. So I had, it's, I think it's really hard in high school to see past the point of like subjects as subjects into su subjects that open doors into things you don't even know exist. Yeah. I didn't even know that this kind of career path existed. That, yeah, I'd be really surprised to know this is where I ended up. I would be pretty happy. Like, I always yeah. thought renewable energy is cool. I think a lot of people do. Wind turbines, I think, are gorgeous. I know a lot of people don't, but yeah. Yeah, especially when you stand beneath them, you're like, whoa, what a, what a crazy engineering feat that that's such a crazy, beautiful piece of engineering to do that, isn't it? It's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just the fact that, you know, we can generate electricity like using wind, using solar, in New Zealand, especially using hydro, and that you can get that to your house. Like that process isn't simple. And it's like now that I've kind of had the, the opportunity to, Kind of step into that and understand that it's been just so interesting yeah pretty crazy and um what is what is your journey like going to going to university choosing to leave wellington going down south what were some of the challenges that you faced as you chose to go down this pathway right here yeah i think there's there's a lot in first year of just the massive learning curve of leaving home like leaving cities like like starting again um it was really cool, I guess, at, at Otago, like the when everyone's there starting again, it's it's easy to kind of start again with everyone. And that's a really cool experience. But there's definitely parts of it where it's you kind of just miss the simplicity of the people at home who know you, the things at home that you know. Um and then like I guess going from Wellington to Dunedin. It's not that far, but it is, you know, there's the different islands. It's becoming quite removed from your family and friends for, for kind of long stretches of time. Like you don't want to be going back all the time. Um, that that can be quite difficult. That There are definitely parts, I think, when I was in my undergrad where I did just start to feel a lot more disconnected from, I guess, those support networks that I had known. But then at the same time, it's, you're kind of developing new ones. So that's really cool and exciting, um, but it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the key thing. It doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, um, both things are happening a lot of times. You, have, you are losing, losing inverted commas, the, the strength of those networks, but you're growing the other one at the same time. But you can't see that until until later on. And that's the, that's the beauty of life, essentially, isn't it? When these things yeah. happen all the time. Yeah. And I think it's really easy as well to just always be comparing comparing where you are at that point in time to what you were used to it's like when you do it like that it's like ah oh, Dunedin's so cold like Wellington was way better or you know like just little things or like the bus system in Wellington was so good like why are there no buses in Dunedin just like things like that and then just I guess once you kind of like build into it you've got time to kind of actually kind of establish, establish yourself like once I was established in Dunedin I loved it yeah, really loved it. But it took a long time to kind of realize that, especially leaving home for the first time, I think, and like moving into something like quite a different situation from being at home, going to high school, everything's very much like structured for you to suddenly just like endless freedom, but kind of no roots to ground you. Um, it's definitely a learning curve. Yeah. And that's the hard thing. Like, there's, there's no way to describe it. You can, you can do all the books in the world, listen to all the podcasts in the world, but until you're actually in that, you have no idea what it actually feels like. So, um, it's really I like the way you you say that. You know, you if you've got freedom but no roots, which is such a great analogy of what university life is like. And actually, moving to any new place is, is a bit like that there, but specifically university. Earlier on in your in when we when you spoke about who you were at the moment, I'd love to know about the time when you how did you discover energy management because you know it's so niche. Um, and, you know, at university, you have opportunities, but how did you go for oh, this is something that I, was it a lecturer that sparked interest? Was it a conversation or was it just, you walked into the wrong room and I go, oh, I'm in the wrong class, what's going on here? 
Yeah, yeah, it was really a classmate because the the first year of um, chemistry, oh, I'm sorry, of physics and energy management is exactly the same. Yep. So you have to do first year physics. I was, I'd already signed up. I'd locked in. I was doing first year physics. And there were two people who I was in halls with that were had decided they wanted to do energy management. Or maybe one of them at that point had decided that she was going to do energy management. Um, and she already knew that, but had to do first year physics. And then I think she was going to go to this information event about in energy management and I kind of just decided I'd go along found out a bit more about it and thought it was kind of interesting but I still wasn't sure about it for a while I thought it was like the cheat way out because physics especially was getting really difficult it was really pushing me and I was wondering if I just couldn't do it and I thought like if changing degrees or changing course did that kind of mean that I was telling myself that I wasn't good enough to do that, that I couldn't learn those things. So I was really worried about that for quite a while. That It got to a point that when I started my second year, I just did both. I was doing the energy management and the physics papers because I wasn't, I still wasn't quite sure. But I got to the end of it, that first semester of second year, and could see like, I did the physics paper and I did well in it but I really wasn't enjoying it anywhere near as much as I was enjoying the energy management stuff. So like doing them parallel definitely did help me make that decision, especially kind of seeing that physics was cool. And I was really like, it was really challenging, but it felt very pointless at times. Like it was derivations and calculations and learning theories, but with no purpose. Whereas when I walked across the room and went to the energy management courses, that was, we were learning all of those things, but with a purpose. Like at the end of it, it was, you could see that this equation, this area, this activity, this exercise, you're working out kind of the physics behind how this turbine is working. You're working like the energy output of this type of machinery. It was like, you, there was a tangible purpose to it. And I just really needed that. Whereas physics didn't feel quite as tangible. Yeah, yeah that, 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 I like that because you know um, you don't know what you don't know, as you said before, and you know sometimes just those spon- those spontaneous decisions to go to a workshop or information session can just lead you down a path that you have no idea. And one thing that I really liked about there was a write up about you a few a few years ago, and I just looked it up again. Um, we you we I like the line where your lecturer said to you, "It's all good to go to climate change marches, but you actually have, have to." go and do some stuff before you can make a difference. And I think that's so, so true, isn't it? Yeah, I think about that a lot, especially at the moment. Um, and like there's everyone I think is really engaged. I think people are more engaged than industry give them credit for. Like people want to reduce emissions. People want to stop climate change impact, but people aren't empowered or don't feel empowered enough themselves to know what to do with that. So we go to climate marches and we read up on it and we talk about, oh, you know, like we want this and, you know, we everyone should be doing this and be more renewable. But how you actually can can be a part of that is a lot is harder. Yeah. Um, and as soon as my lecturer kind of pointed out, he's like, you will get so much more out of do, going to these lectures, doing this degree, like being able to have an impact than actually just marching. I was like, that really make sense and I do think about that yeah I think and I think if we extrapolate to a lot of a lot I mean the world is in in turmoil all the time but we're increasing at the moment and you know sometimes I sit back and I think about if I should go to a march or not go to a march I'm like by going to a march it's awesome but is there another way that we can help whatever whatever the march is about and you know and the problem is the world or people um label you based on whether you go to a march or not but they don't see the other stuff that you might be doing behind the scenes which is something that you might go you might go cool i won't go to the march there but i'm actually doing all this other stuff behind the scenes and there's no right or wrong it's just the perception of the world you know as you said before the comparative world that we live in is just it's a bit crazy but um it's pretty awesome that your lecture pointed out there because sometimes that's awareness there where you're right cool hey this is awesome this is also awesome and you, you have the same outcome or a different outcome which is beautiful and um, what about your first your first foray into industry when you had your summer shift with um, Aurora? How was that? Yeah, that was great. That I learned so much. Um, 
And I think there's a lot of value in internships, especially just to give you that little taste. And I, I learned a lot in that it was my first exposure to how the electricity industry worked specifically. Um, and that I had to learn a lot in that. Um, but then also just the way like being in that kind of business works. And that was also something else to learn. So it was like on one side, you're learning like the, the electricity elements. Um, I was exposed to like how the electricity market works for the first time. And there was like all of those things and then kind of like technical learning that you're doing with that. But it also just kind of those like other skills like about like how businesses operate, like where you fit in the business. That was also something to really wrap my head around. Um, but I really enjoyed that little bit of exposure. It helped me see that I think that was that that kind of gave me that realization that this is the kind of thing that I want to pursue. I think coming off the back of that, then doing like the next year at uni, um, I could see, I guess, kind of where I wanted to go. But trying to open those doors was really, really difficult. Um, and that's something I faced, especially after that first internship where I was like, yeah, okay, I think I want to maybe do a grad program. I want to work in the electricity or the energy industry in this way. Um, but a lot of the time just getting kind of doors closed because I wasn't an engineer. I didn't fit this very specific criteria of what they wanted to to be in their grad program. And it took me a while to to kind of get past that. That I, I remember talking to one of the careers people at the university um, and she said that at this point, if people are going to keep shutting doors because you don't have, you're not ticking that criteria of what they want, she said, you need to find the back doors. You need to start like kind of going out to to those people, making those connections and then finding your way that way. And that that was quite interesting. That I guess was kind of for the first time made me realize kind of the valuable of starting to have those connections with people in an in industry and how important that is for trying to I guess get jobs but also kind of make projects or jobs get off the ground um and I was really lucky that with that first internship we were able to present the findings at an industry conference um and after that after people saw me at that conference presenting um our results that was what was able to get me like my next job and then because I had that job I was able to get another job and then from there another and like that was but without having been able to do that first internship which came about because of someone who'd done the energy management degree saying we need these people because they know what they're doing we should be kind of leveraging them and him like specifically going out for for energy uh, energy management people to fill this role then like that first leg up and then being able to kind of like build those connections from there I wouldn't it would have been a lot harder to get to where I did in the end yeah and that, that just speaks to the um the power of connection and the power of being in the right room with the right people you know as you said if you weren't presenting at that room with the right people you know who knows what would happen and it, it's so crazy because um I think this is what I like to talk to people about it's all good having your CV and having a fantastic college university but if you are not leveraging your connections to get that first job is 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 hard and then, but once you get the first job that's when things start snowballing so um really awesome to see how that worked out for you but also if we think about how how the universe works the fact that it was an energy man, man, man graduate that actually sought you out which would be which is pretty crazy right you go actually wait a minute this is actually a full circle moment where an actual otago sorry a grad from this university has seized the potential crazy um i'm going to ask you a a, a non-related study question um because it's interesting in the space that you work in obviously now we have all these amazing evs that are out there uh, what are your thoughts about how the world of, of evs are going you know with tesla and everyone are producing evs and um the question i have is, is not not about what do you think about Elon Musk? It's more about, you know, the EV market is now shooting up. What is that? What do you think that's going to do onto our electricity grid requirements? And it's awesome that we have them, but is there also another side that, we, that we're not leveraging thinking about at the same time? Wow. Um, great question. I actually did my master's looking into the, just that topic. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So perfect. Um, I love EVs. I think they're fantastic. I think 
like from an operations perspective, an EV is going to reduce your emissions for transport significantly. Like a full electric, like battery electric vehicle will reduce your transport emissions very significantly. And also your operation costs for that are going to be a lot lower. So from that perspective, they're really great. And I guess maybe in in light of this week's events with kind of the the, the supply issues on the grid, um, maybe people are really concerned about the impact that EVs are going to have. And they are going to have a really big impact. But as the problem from what I see is less about like having enough generation to meet the supply of EVs, like that generation is is becoming available. You know, there's, there's, I think Meridian have a wind farm that's coming online later this year. Um, there's other kind of generation things in the pipeline um, that that's all coming and investment is being put into that. The really hard part is the bit in the middle. Like how are you going to connect that electricity that's being generated to the EVs and where they are? Um, because if you if you think about your house for a second and you use electricity in your house, you know, you have a fridge, you have an oven, you go to your washing machine, your dryer, there's lights, there's TVs, like there's electricity appliances and they're being used. But if you think of kind of the impact at a household level of then charging an EV on top of that, and if you're doing and it the the real impact is not just about the amount of electricity, it's the when factor. And I'm not yeah. sure how much people are aware of that, that choosing to use your electricity between like 5 and 8 p.m., whether that's kind of putting the dishwasher on or running the washing machine or charging your EV if you have one, that has a much bigger impact than doing those things at 9 p.m. or overnight or in the middle of the day even. Um, so if your EV is going to be charged at night at the same time that you're home and you're cooking dinner and all of that, that does have a bigger impact. And that's because kind of the 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 bottleneck constraints of getting the electricity from where it's generated to where you are, uh, that part is the the difficulty. And electricity networks, the the poles and wires guys that maintain the electricity. That, the, that you see kind of on your street and those lines like going through the city, their job in that space is difficult at the moment and they're having to see huge investments and huge works to try and meet that. But the generation is coming. I think this week as well was quite a, a one of those things where all the holes in the cheese aligned. So from what I understood, is unseasonably cold weather, so that doesn't help. It was planned maintenance, which meant that some of our generation assets, like some of the things we'd usually be using to generate electricity, were off being like kind of checked over ahead of the winter demand where they're going to be really needed. And then it was also not windy. So when it's not windy, wind farms can't really do a lot. And that kind of has an impact as well. Yeah. But, oh, I love that. and one other thing I'll say about EVs is a, uh, they are, and if you think about there's close to, there's about what, four, four million EVs, oh, sorry, four million vehicles in New Zealand, if we think like just around like cars, if all of those were EVs tomorrow, that impact is going to be huge, but that isn't going to happen, like it's more, more gradual than that, and the, the, the more difficult problem really is tackling issues around heavy transport, and that's been in what I do at the moment. It's been really interesting working with freight providers or um, more from like the network side. How do they get ready for how do you even charge an electric truck? Like if it doesn't have long to charge, so you have to charge it at really fast rates, the load and electricity demand for an electric truck is going to be huge. Um, so those, the heavy transport side of things is a lot more difficult where EVs are kind of the, the easier fish to fry, but they also offer a huge opportunity. So EVs aren't just a problem. Um, one thing that is talked a lot about in the energy industry is around the flexibility of demand. So is there opportunities to charge things overnight? Is there opportunities to shift demand to meet more of when there might be generation available? So if the sun's shining 
can we shift demand to that time to make the most of solar that's being generated? Or if it's really windy, can we be charging EVs then? Like trying yeah. to, so one thing that's happening is trying to develop mechanisms to get that that communication going so that if there is the ability to generate and there's a lot of generation coming, then can we shift load to those times? And also with EVs, if we have a situation like we did this week where there is looking like a shortfall in generation, can we not charge EVs or even EVs are a battery? Can we discharge EVs to meet peaks in demand and then charge them when demand's lower? So although they're going to increase demand, they also start giving us a tool around shifting demand and kind of some flexibility, which is something we're really going to need with increased amounts of wind, solar, that variable climate kind of weather-based generation, which is unpredictable and we can't really do a lot about it. I, I, that's, I love that because um, there's so much in there that is um, that is so informative. And I think the key thing that you mentioned there was it's not about it's not about the quantity, it's about the, the, the timing. So if you all if we're all charging at the same time, there's gonna be a problem. But if we stay away through the day and you know we use different times, then like I said before, we all have our stoves on, we all have our microwaves on, we have our fridges on all the time. And if we just think about an EV at a different time, that might help. And the reason I ask the question is because you know there's always this proponents of EVs and there's mm -hmm. humans here always got pro and con, pro and con, and you always hear the same arguments coming through. But it's awesome to hear from someone that is actually a science in the field to go actually wait a minute, you know, they are you're thinking about this, it's not just brushed aside. These things are not just mm. spoken about, they're actually thought about as you develop the, the, the solutions. As you said before at the start, solving problems. This is basically problem solving all day, every day, which every, whatever technology we have, which is really cool. Yeah, and I think one thing that people often think with EVs that I really struggle with is like the, the batteries themselves, like lithium, that's not a renewable source. Like, that's true. But it's kind of getting kind of that question of, we have to mine for lithium. Is that a better resource to be using than coal and gas and kind of petrol? It's like kind of a, a pick your battle statement. Whereas people, yeah. I think a lot of the time they want to poke holes in the EV argument. Like they'll say things like the electricity isn't that renewable anyway in New Zealand. That's completely false. And or like, you know, batteries, like what are we going to do with all the batteries at the end? It's like, well, a lot of people, a lot of really smart people are working on that problem. And also just kind of the question of, yeah, the, the resources used for the batteries, that's not that renewable. But I argue the alternative is worse. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're never going to have everyone happy. The humans are humans. They're always going to complain about different things. And it's just, but I think what's important is, like you said, right from at the start, when you're married to an idea, this is when problems help. But if you go, actually, wait a minute, you know, it's, if humans, if, if an individual is like, EVs are bad, and then they go, they hear you or hear someone else going, actually, and then they change their mind, then you're like, cool, I've got major respect for you because you have the ability to change your mind. But if you have someone who's so stuck and stubborn with the ideas, even if they hear what you're saying, what they're saying, then you actually, wait a minute, this is a bit ridiculous here. Yeah. This argument has got no legs because you're not choosing to actually listen to another counterpoint to what you're saying. But that's human nature, right? That's human nature, and we all, we all do that no matter what. Um, yeah. I heard um, a speaker recently at an event say that you're never going to change people's minds unless you can change the context. So, and like he, he talked about some examples of like you can, like the classic one is you can view the glass half full or half empty. It's like it's the same glass, but you're looking at it with kind of a different context either way. And yeah. since then, I've really thought about that because it's a lot of the time, you know, you you do come up with people with really strong opinions. They're not going to change their mind, and that's fair enough. But what is it that we can be doing to change the context in which they're making these decisions? Um, I think that's something really powerful. Yeah, that's so it reminds me of a of a. Um... A visual I've seen many, many times, and the visual is of a bottle of water, and they show the bottle of water being sold at, say, um, at a at a children's rugby game for fifty cents, and then the same bottle of water being sold at, say, a supermarket for two dollars, the same bottle of water then being sold at a petrol station for, say, 
five dollars and at the airport for ten dollars exact same bottle of water but in a different context it has a different different value so you know like you said for context matters and this is you know as you have your conversations with people it's all about contextualizing where that frame of mind is because it's exactly the same thing but a different context mm. um we've, we've been focusing a lot on your, on your energy on the energy's passion that you have are there any other paths of as you navigated your your university path of becoming an adult and as you explore the world now are there any other paths that you're really passionate about um that you go hey this is this is the kind of stuff that really gets me going i think um one thing I am really passionate about is like I I'm really privileged to know the things I know or be in the position that I am trying to find those ways to kind of give back um and I, I thought it, a lot of it is kind of a scale in that I guess there's a lot of the time there's there's two ways that I can think of off the top of my head that you can give back to to communities and that's around like either with time if you can volunteer or if it's with like financial resources. And as a student, especially, financial resources were tight, but I can give a lot more of my time. Um, and that's something that that I'm still passionate about, that I like. I like trying to find ways that I can take the things that I know and be able to give back or the the time that I have and try and invest that in a way that I can give back. But also making sure that I have time for myself. And I think that's something that can be really hard to to manage. Like at university, when there's like so many assignments and there's people everywhere and you got your flatmates and you got friends and there's there's so much going on that it was also like really important to find time for myself. So I was always picking up different hobbies. Um, like I love running or cycling. At one point I took up kayak racing just to to have those kind of outlets of time that I could spend for myself because that kind of is like that recharging bit that I need to then be able to go and learn all the things I need to learn to go and do all the things that I want to do and be able to like I guess help others more I think that that's so so good I'm, I'm just chuckling because um Last week's guest, Anna said, Anna Clark, I don't know if you know her, but she said the same thing. She does kayaking and just through kayaking that she met the most random conversations and you mentioned kayaking as well. So I was like, oh, maybe I should take up kayaking because it seems to be the thing that people do to get some cool ideas. Um, but yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, 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 really cool, Anita. And what has it been like now? Um, so you've finished a few university um, career, I guess, and you've entered the working world. What is that transition like? You know, we spoke about the transition from going to school to university and then... Um, now that you're in the working world, how has that been for you? You know, um, you you leave the need and you're willing to know, but there was a, a phase as well where you were not into in the back at home as well. Yeah, um, it was so hard. I remember my first week at work. So first time in this full time job, working a desk job in the office. It was like information overload. I think it was about Wednesday, so I started on the Monday. I think I got to Wednesday and I was walking to work, and it just hit me. I was like this is me now for the next 40 years. Like, this is, this is it. Like, this is, this is where, like, the last stop on the train. And I guess that's not true. Like, I've yep. come, like, kind of through that. But, like, it was really hard going from at university. It's like, you got to get through this semester. And then you do the next semester. And you do the next semester. And then maybe you finished undergrad. You do postgrad. It's like, oh, okay, that's a year, maybe two years. It's all very like short stuff that you can kind of sprint through and see the end of. And suddenly it just hit me that I can't see an end to this. Like this is what I do now. And that was really, really daunting. And it took a, a lot also getting used to, like as a student, I had the freedom to work when I knew I was going to be productive, when I knew that that was my priority. And then I had time to spend time with friends or go for a run or do those other things. I could be flexible with how I chose to use my time. Whereas now working a job, it's much more structured. It's I'm obliged to be here from this time to this time. I got to work even if I'm tired, if I don't want to be there, if I've got more important things going on in my personal life, that doesn't necessarily matter. It's I have a contract and I need to be here. And I think that loss of flexibility really hit me hard. And like, and saying that work 
most companies are very flexible. So I do still have a lot of flexibility and I'm very lucky for that. Um, but it's yeah, definitely not as flexible as that as that student life. And that has taken a lot of getting used to. Yeah, it's it's so funny how you, you know, we um we go to university and we go, oh, this is great. And then um everyone's rushing to finish up university and when you finish up university oh actually um it's, it's, it's a little bit different you know the the real world a little bit different we as you said before you're obliged to do certain things and you know when i'm when i'm in, in high schools i'm talking to your 13s and they're like oh we just want to finish our degree as quick as possible and i was like i don't know about that there i just rethink about that because um you know university is great like no no no, no i want to get done in two years I'm like mm, okay cool 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 and then what happens and it's really quite funny this year i'm having a lot of conversations with people in the third year who are like actually i don't think i want to finish my degree just yet i need to spend a bit longer because i don't feel like i'm really going to the end of the bigger wide world which is quite interesting yeah exactly like i was the same i was i just want to get through this move on to the next thing and i think i got to the end of my undergrad and and i was like ah oh, I just don't quite feel done yet. So I did an honors and I did the honors and I was like, oh, I just feel like there's more that I could be doing. Like I, I'm not quite done with this yet. So then I did a master's. I got to the master's and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, now I think I'm ready. But it wasn't until I kind of hit postgrad that I realized I shouldn't have rushed through the undergrad trying to do as many papers as I could fit into a year. There was one year I did nine papers. Oh, wow. <laughs> nine papers over a semester or something. Or nine over a year. No, it would have been yeah, nine over a year. A year, yeah. And that was that was terrible. That was not worth it. That taking the time to kind of work through it because, like, your university papers are not the most important thing. And it wasn't, I guess, until I got to postgrad that I could see that. That actually the the time that you are also developing as a person in that time that's really important and whether it is like joining university groups um kind of being involved in a bunch of initiatives that you didn't even know about making friends taking that because you have that time using that time to do the things that you really enjoy and are passionate about you don't have to be trying to just cram as many assignments as you can and get them all done just so you can sprint through your degree and get on to the next thing. And I think there's almost a, a kind of a, a a feeling like when you're doing your undergrad that if you're not doing it in three years, what's wrong with you? Like, yeah. why is it taking longer? Why well, you have another extra semester to do? Uh, well, you know, it's like, I definitely thought that at first. I was like, you should be doing it in three years. That's That's that. And now I say it's it's about the learning. It's not about kind of trying to rush through it. It's if you're going to get the most out of it by taking your time, taking more papers, then that's what you should be doing. Like there's heaps of things that now I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I'd done a paper on that, or I wish I'd gone and tried that at university. And it, so I can always go back to university, but at the moment I don't want to. But if I'd kind of taken that time while I was there and in that headspace to to enjoy it and just try and like learn as much as I could and see a sprint through it, that would have been a much more kind of valuable way to use that undergrad time. Yeah, I think kind of you've had this, you had the same experience as well as you were in the first half. You know, I remember when I first spoke to you, you had your plan of like eight or nine papers in, in the first year. And I was like, you're not doing that there, buddy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think I think that's the naivety of just you know wanting to get involved and wanting to get stuck in and doing it all. But I think it's also that mentality about always going to the next thing. You know, I do this and then I go there and then I go there and then eventually, you know. But yeah, I think most people in university realize that actually, you know, like there there's never going to be an end point realistically. You know, there's always going to be something else that you find. You know, like for me, coaching. You know, that came out of the blue and now that's a new thing that I'm trying to endeavor towards and i'm sure you know in the next year or so there'll be something else that i start enjoying and go okay cool that can be a part of my life now and i think you just got to be willing to constantly adjust you know because that's part of the freedom especially while you're still you know in your 20s early 30s is having that freedom to go and explore and still do things and still change you know like there's nothing you know i think it's all it's always been the narrative of you know you finish uni then you get a job then you get a house and partner and kids and you know like it's that's always been the narrative and you know like it's almost been flipped on its head 
by quite a lot of people in their twenties, early thirties that are now like, no, actually I want to take more time to go travel or focus on my career or do those kinds of things. So it's, yeah, like obviously, you know, there's going to be a point in your life when you want to do those things and tick off those accomplishments if that's what you want to do, but also, yeah, just being willing to adjust and adjust and adjust. And I think that's, that's the struggle that I'll find once I get more permanent work is, you know, like I still want to have the freedom to, go and do the things I enjoy because I think that's you know that that's the whole reason you go and do what you, you want to do each day is to go and do the things you actually enjoy not to just tick off the oh I'm going to work cool that's you know on to the next day so yeah yeah I think it's it's a really interesting thing because and I know I'm terrible for it that I've become like I need I can't stop sprinting through everything but then you don't take the time to look back and actually acknowledge that what you've just done is really great and like that reflection piece is is harder than the sprint and like remembering to have that but also just the the feeling that you have to get through it you have to do it you have to tick all those boxes that that kind of that need for progress is also almost dangerous sometimes and i know the hardest part for me of my masters was in the first 2 months having to totally adjust the way i worked from being all about kind of every time I handed in that assignment that was a piece of progress or every time I got through this part of the course that was another piece of progress and like having those measurable steps that were always very short duration you know it was always just a week or two away and that was your step in progress so starting my master's that was a year of research no course no structure I just had a year and I had to write a thesis and I remember like getting to the start of it and I had like my first meeting with my master supervisors and they're like okay just go take a month and find your thesis and I just thought it was crazy I was like what we need to be like we we need to be doing the lit review or the intro like we need something like there should there should be progress and I think I got to about two months and I was just so unhappy and I was really regretting the decision to even do a master's. And um, one of the PhD students in my department just asked me, oh, how's it going? And I was honest. I was like, not well. Like I've got nothing. I've done nothing. It's been two months and there is no progress. And he kind of turned to me and he's like, you can't you can't think of it like that. If, if that's the way you're going to think about it, you're never going to get through it. It's not about like these steps of progress you know it's about the end result like take a step back and think about the end result and enjoy the process like enjoy the learning of it enjoy the fact that you know the you might not have those like little steps to to make you feel like you're winning and getting that that progress but like the the journey is much bigger than that and it took quite a while for me to get that shift um but once I did it was it was totally fine. I really enjoyed the masters and the experience, but that, that first couple of months was really rough. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's not your fault. Like Tony said before, we're all ingrained. We have this cultural ingrainment um, through society to the world. We, we have to tick off certain boxes in certain amount of times. And because of that, we go, right, cool. It's just, we've got to just get things done, tick boxes. Um, it's quite timely because at the moment I'm doing some study and I have, I have assignments every single week and I'm like, am I, learning for the sake of learning or am I learning for the sake of the assignment because I feel like I'm just learning for the sake of the assignment which is a bit ridiculous actually but actually I'm learning because I want to learn you know so it's it's quite a timely timely conversation because I think a lot of us learn for the sake of the assignment but not learn for the sake of learning um, which is two very different ways of thinking of things yeah so it's um, it's, it's it's pretty funny how that how that happens to all of us really Alina, we've been speaking for almost an hour now. Um, you know, we oh, could talk. Yeah, exactly. We, we could be talking way, way more. Um, but what I'd like to do is um, invite you to, to answer this question. We ask all of our guests um, this question here. Our, our podcast is called Baskets of Knowledge, and we invite our guests to share a piece of knowledge to put into our baskets um, based on anything, you know, your, your learning, your, your life experiences, anything that you think myself, Tani, and our listeners would would benefit from um i think something that i've learned this year and that i keep thinking about not i guess related to work or what i do or what i study but it's more just the 
the way I view time. It is quite, I guess, similar to what we we're just talking about about sprinting through things, but also, um, I guess, like this feeling of like always needing to be doing more and trying to fit more into my day and trying to take on more responsibilities, more tasks, do more extracurriculars. Um, that like I've started viewing time as a Jenga tower. Well, someone gave me this analogy. I've been viewing time as a Jenga tower and I can just keep can meet, keep stacking the blocks, keep moving the blocks around. But at some point it's going to fall. It's just not sustainable. I can't do that. But I need to be thinking about time as a pie chart. It's There's only 100%. I can't use more than 100% of the time that I have. And sometimes that pie chart is going to change. Uh, the segment for this might get bigger. You know, my priorities are going to change. The things going on in my life are going to change, but I can't change the fact that the pie chart is 100%. And that's something that I keep trying to come back to because, um, yeah, I think it, it's been really valuable for me to try and think of it that way instead of to always just be trying to do more. Um, forget the Jenga tower, think of the pie chart. I guess it also works well for me because I love graphs and pie chart and Excel and, like, that's my whole life now. But... I think just the the visual of you can't be more than a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I love that because you know it's not just you. I think many of us live in a world where we treat time as a jingle block and we just try and try to balance things. And then at some point, you know, um at some point we seeing in the in the in the media, in, in a lot of um, conversations out there, this topic of burnout. And that's probably because everyone treats life like a jingle block. But if you can actually hundred percent. And like you said, um, Alita, the hundred your hundred percent changes every day. You know, sometimes your hundred percent might be a, a massive pie chart. Sometimes it might be a small pie chart, but it's a hundred percent of your hundred percent on that particular day. Um, and those signals will change. So that's a really beautiful piece of knowledge for all of us listening. You know, in all contexts of our life. So thank you for that, there. Tani, any last um, questions for Alita? Oh, it's been a really good conversation. I think particularly around the energy stuff, you know, like it's, I think it's a big topic that I think a lot of us probably take for granted and we probably don't, you know, discuss it or have those conversations until it's, you know, essentially too late or, you know, like it's, so it's just, it's good to start, I guess, growing awareness for myself and, you know, also hopefully our listeners get a bit more awareness around it. Um but I guess, as you say, you know, as Prakash said, you know, we've got to start doing things ourselves and, uh, you know, like it's like anything where we want to make change, but it's about how can we start doing it individually and then we can start looking at, you know, the different ways that we can support other people to, yeah, contribute to the cause. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'd really encourage everyone. I think it's really important that everyone kind of looks into to energy, like get, get the facts. How does the electricity get to you? Because I think it is something that we do really take for granted, but we do have a lot of power over our power and how we use it and when we use it. And that all has a big effect on how renewable electricity is or how much carbon emissions being generated from your electricity use. You know, the there is a lot that people can do about that that I think they don't realize. So really good thing, I think, that people should should look into, try and find out more about. And you know where they could do that there? Like if somebody was like, hey, we're a leader, this is awesome, but how do I do that there? Do we just Wikipedia it? Do we YouTube it? Do we, is there a place where you go, actually, this is a great resource for anyone to have access to, or do we just find ourselves? I can't think of any one resource. I think you can Google it and look it up, but the, there's the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority, ECA, like E-E-C-A. They have a lot of really good resources about all of this kind of stuff that, you can go into a, a real dive into just a whole lot of different topics about energy um, and they're all there. And a lot of that is like quite useful information for consumers. Like we do have a lot of power of our energy use. We don't have to just accept high electricity bills all the time or accept the fact that, you know, there might be power outages or accept the fact that the grid generates carbon emissions because we still have Huntley burning coal. And, you know, you don't have to accept that. There are things that you can do about it. No, I, I put you on the spot there, but I think it's really important. You know, ECO is available. There's some pretty cool resources out there for us to, like you said, take power over our power, um, which is beautiful. Another great saying that take power over our power. I love it. Um, Alida, any, any, uh, anything else that you'd like to share because you know I just focused on stuff that I knew about you and I learned a lot about you as well today anything else that you'd like to share 
with myself and Tanya and our listeners before we, we wrap up? No, I think, I think we've covered a lot today. Um, I've definitely spoken way too much. So no, it's haven't. just fun to call it there. <laughs> no, you haven't. Yeah. But I just, want, I just want to appreciate and, and acknowledge, you know, as you said before, reflection points are really important. And this is a great reflection point for me, as I said at the start, you know, reflecting on meeting you as a year 13 and then bumping to you when I see you on campus, you know, um, I think I saw you in your first year, then I saw you again when you had your um, internship, and then I seen you popping up my LinkedIn. And just a reflection point for you to, to realize that the power that you have is really um, awesome. I use your name a lot when I speak to young Wahine in schools about um, STEM. And the reason I use that is because, like we said at the start, people don't see themselves in that space, but I want to challenge them and actually have hey, wait a minute. Um, there are some young amazing um, young people who are in the space yet that are not the typical stereotypical xyz you know um and i always name drop you as in cat so i just want you to know the power that you have even though you might not know you have the power out there the power of doing what you've done is really um has an amazing ripple effect so um just want to acknowledge you for that so that's really beautiful oh that's awesome i think it's it's so important um especially you know to be encouraging young women into stem roles i think it's there's a lot of that imposter syndrome and that's really like you, you just don't think that you're smart enough or that you can't do it. But industry really needs those women voices. Like it, We offer a different perspective, a different lens, a different way of looking at things. And you can't solve problems when everyone is a carbon copy of each other looking at things the exact same. You know, you need that diversity and you have so much more to offer than what you realize. Even if you know, you might find maths really hard. It's there's like you can always learn. There are roles within STEM for you if you're passionate about it. That it's really important, I think, to to really get that message across. And I, I thank you for doing that. Like you know, talking talking to those women, like getting them to consider STEM careers because that's a hard job in itself. Like actually getting the awareness that this is something you can do. That like that first step I think is is hard like helping people realize that yeah no um and you make and people like you make it easier so thank you um thank you Alita for jumping on our podcast today I've learned a lot about the work that you do but again um appreciate you as a human being you do some pretty cool things and I've learned a lot about you so thank you for sharing that there so our listeners out there hopefully you've enjoyed today's podcast if you haven't and you haven't done anything go back and listen again because we're sure you'll be listening on two times speed so you've missed out the good stuff. Um, so go back and listen again. Um, till next time, don't forget to keep smiling, be happy, and don't forget to put something in your past knowledge. Till then, bye everybody. Peace. Thank you for listening to Bastards of Knowledge. Yeah, we hope that you found something useful to put into your Bastards of Knowledge. And as we said before, remember to put something little into your Bastards of Knowledge every week. And as always, feel free to like, comment, and share this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.